Radio Show with your host, Monty Clark. We stand together and accept that we now live in a world transformed by Fukushima. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time here on UCY.TV Radio. We relentlessly engage every ear that listens. We expose and confront the complete lack of accountability for the nuclear industry. Consider social engineering programs to view our bodies, minds, and souls as assets on a balance sheet. We discuss vital current issues, interview activists, and engage our audience in an effort to allow all voices to be heard. The Age of Vision Radio Show creates a venue that all will choose. We encourage our listeners to reclaim their power and their courage to take action and save our planet from the ravages of greed and indifference. Our actions matter. Every voice matters. We remind our listeners that happiness is resistance. Love is greater than fear. Good morning, UCY.TV radio listeners. This is Lonnie Clark with the Age of Fission radio show. Thank you for joining us once again. Today's Wednesday. That means it's interview day. And uh, I want to thank Heidi Lambert for coming on the air. I called her last minute. I had uh, been talking to a guest, another guest who I do hope to have on later, and I'll save his name for later if he comes on. But Heidi stepped in right away, uh, very late. I met Heidi uh, about maybe a month ago, was it? A month and a half, Heidi, uh, through Mimi Gurman. We got together. Mimi got, we we all agreed, the three of us, that we were going to get serious. We actually had a meeting with a group of people who have been engaged with No Nukes Northwest in Salem and decided to get serious and uh, turn this into a nonprofit and really become a player in the game. So we've got uh, Mimi Gurman and Heidi Lambert have been extremely engaged with this process for a long time. Heidi is, well, this is how she sent me like a six-page cover letter about herself to kind of give me the full background because when I met her, I'm like, oh my gosh, I want you on my radio show. (laughs) So hi, Heidi. Hi, Lonnie. Thanks for having me. Uh, Heidi is from Hanford. That's really, but she is now an active member of nonukesnorthwest.org. Please go to our Facebook page. Full disclosure, I'm one of the three uh, directors on the board of this nonukesnorthwest.org because we needed to get it together, and I got us uh, nonprofit status since I do know how to do that for work. <laughs> Yes, and so here she is, and wait till you hear her story. As you know on my show, I like to talk about not just the facts of the radiation and how it killed people and gives us cancer and who got cancer and all the sad stories because that happened around the entire nuclear industry. I want to understand the why. Heidi's from Hanford. Her father worked there. Heidi, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, Well, I was uh, born in Portland, but went to the Tri-Cities area really young when my father um, graduated from college, and he started work at Hanford. Um, His title was a weapon designer, and uh, when he started work at Hanford, it was, uh, I believe, 1974, and it was still very top secret. It actually was the largest top secret file uh, ever filed in the U.S. history um, was about Hanford. And, of course, it was because it was a nuclear um, site. And um, it also was a weapon design place, but they also were they were switching to be more about energy. And um, so they were shifting from being a weapons place to being a place that makes affordable energy. And 
in the 70s, um, lots of people were sick and dying, um, and, and more than just Hanford, uh, although Hanford was the first site um, where they stored waste in the U.S. And um, so in the 70s, they started to, the people started demanding information. And there was information laws that they could only hide things for so many decades. And so things were starting to come out. And one of the things that came out in the late 70s was a thing called the Green Run. And um, although I was born in Portland, my parents were both from eastern Washington and grew up in Yakima. And, um, and they were all farmers. So my dad was really interested in the Green Run because the Green Run was where the government actually admitted that they knowingly poisoned the people. With um, what? And they, what did they poison them with? Well, they poisoned them with radiation. Um, and they say they did it on purpose. They said they released it purposely from Hanford to follow the wind patterns. And they said it was all controlled. And it was an iodine. It was one of the iodine radiation. So are they, actually, are they following every single person that hit that wind pattern? Oh, God, no. Oh, God, no. Because at the time that they did it, they didn't track the people. It wasn't about the people at all. It was about the, the factory. It was about the radiation, the, the reactor, and how the reactor works. I mean, the, the science takes prominence. The science, uh, nuclear science takes prominence over people. People are just what they call collateral damage. It's just the loss that they get to get the research and the knowledge we, that they We need. literally are assets on their balance sheets. We yeah. think counts oh, as yeah. this. We have X population, and let's figure out how many of that X we can poison. Right. So my dad went crazy, honestly. My dad um, was a really caring, loving, nurturing person, and he started to realize that he was this tool, that his mind was being used for something that he didn't agree with. And so he really lost it. In the, it was in the late 1970s, early 1980s. He was institutionalized. And essentially what happened was, is Hanford, my dad was just brilliant. He was getting paid all kinds of money. And when he started doubting his job and, and questioning his managers, they just instantly claimed him as unstable and insane. Oh, my so god! happily sending him a check. But what that did was, was that then devalued and, and unvalidated everything that he knew and everything that he'd say. So I grew up with my dad talking about conspiracies and people disappearing and, you know, not trusting the government. And, of course, I thought it was because he was crazy, <laughs> you know. And it wasn't until I was in my late 20s, early 30s, when I moved back to the Tri-Cities and reemerged myself in that culture, you know, a couple decades later as an adult, that I started to see how much he was, he was right on. He was spot on. And I started to see how... The culture there was so unaccepting of anything else. You know, only the people wanted to know that it was safe and everything that was, it was all okay. It's and the 90, per, this is the 90% rule. They adopted, Dr. Goffman explained this in his book. He didn't call it the 90% rule. He just repeated this several places and throughout his book. The two books that I read online, he made mention of it in several places. This is consistent regularly with the attitude adopted by anything related to nuclear. The nuclear scientists, and it, it's pervasive. It goes beyond the level of government and military. It is oh, the yes. nuclear scientists. They have a nuclear priesthood, and they will... Deny that radiation causes harm by 90%. And they, they deny radiation causes harm, and when they have to admit it, they underreport the negative effects by approximately 90%. I love wanting to use the word priesthood because. I so didn't use it. You know who said that? Uh, Dr. Alvin Weinberg, in a statement he gave before a group of nuclear scientists, he used the term. I read that paper on my YouTube channel also. I should reread yeah. that stupid thing because, honestly, it's shocking. He goes, he stands before a group of military uh, 
scientists and nuclear scientists and he says we are we are now the nuclear priesthood we are the new the, uh, the human species has entered into is a Faustian agreement with the nuclear industry and we are now uh, the nuclear priesthood and we are ordained with protecting humanity in perpetuity well that area and that is their attitude yeah, that attitude and arrogance, it so explains it there. Because when you're just a normal person, like say you're just a mom, like I was, um, our opinions had no weight. We don't know anything. They're like, we hire nuclear exactly. scientists and they're engineers and they know, you know. But you this know is where I would self reflect, this... though, because I, my father was one of those people. Uh-huh. So I did have this little voice in my head who was talking about, you know, what about the birds that ate the radioactive bees? What happened to those, you know, my dad was a scientist. He understood that we were talking about atoms. My dad even went as far as to talk about quarks. He would say, you know, these scientists think they know everything about the atom, but we don't even know anything about the quarks. And, you know, the quarks are this little division of the atom. Mm -hmm. Um, But back to the priesthood is these men think that they're, um, you know, acting in the acts of God or whatever, Mother mm-hmm. Nature, and they're messing they with it. And yes. they think they, they assure people they know what they're doing, but it, it's like a horror movie. It's like a bad sci-fi movie um, that know. we're living in. <laughs> I know. And what's really sad is that they convince, like the health physicists, they convince scientists that they are absolutely right, that nuclear is fine. Do you know what a Faustian agreement means? And I'm going to, I looked it up so that I understood it, but I can't, so it couldn't explain it. So it really means that you're willing to sacrifice anything to satisfy a limitless desire for knowledge or power. That's what he meant. Because we're on this quest of humanity. We're like, we need this. Otherwise, we're going to kill ourselves. We are now in a Faustian agreement because guess what? We're super screwed, folks. Like, really? Well, well Lonnie, you know that they know that. They know that. Hanford, That's why the all the contractors so at Hanford, Bechtel, and all those big wigs, Lockheed Martin, they know we're in a no win situation. This is a this is a guaranteed source of income, you know. This is job security for these guys because, you know, New- Hanford started to save the war. Then they saved energy. Then they saved people's health. They didn't it's all save about. Jack. They did not oh, save. Oh, I, I agree with you. I'm saying this is what they think. This is what they say. You That's know? their propaganda. That's their. That's hate their propaganda. Hate yeah, hate and, hate and then it was about nuclear science and about how medicine is. You know, if you go to Hanford. You go to the Chinese area, there's more cancer centers than anywhere else, you know. But now, now when you go there, they get very righteous that their job is to clean it up. Now they're in the cleanup crew. Right. And and that's the part that was so absurd when I lived there um, over the last decade was that if you ask people, you would say, you would drive down the highway and you'd see this gigantic plume coming out of a reactor. Right. And you would say, wow, I didn't know that Hanford was still working. And everyone would look at you like you're stupid. And they'd be like, no, Hanford's closed. They're not making energy out at Hanford. They're not, you know. And so you're like, oh, okay, that's weird. Why is there this plume? But then Why you go to find out. That? Right. Well, they, they leased part of their property to another corporation or another company than the CGS, Columbia Generating um, Station, they own a reactor on Hanford, and they run the the reactor that currently is working on Hanford. But because it's not owned by Hanford, it's owned by CGS, everyone will switch. You see, that's the other problem with this game, is that they keep changing the names. They change the names of the contractors. They change the acronyms of the projects. They change the names of who they're leasing their property out to. So it's, Speaking you know, of acronyms Hanford. of projects, Wendy, this, I mean, th- Heidi, this really shocked me. Uh, you said that this, where there were SMRs at Hanford? No, they're creating SMRs through Hanford. They're working through um, Oregon State University. Yeah, um, I, I knew that, but I thought you meant SMRs that they were are being designed, the, the design is happening in Oregon, and then they're being tested at Hanford, if that makes sense. They're going to be tested at Hanford? Oh, yeah. I believe they've been being tested for the last five years there. It's definitely...
definitely a BE of Washington. Wait a minute. This guy, uh, I saw this story just last year. What's his little name? He's a brand new graduate from the year before he graduated. There was a big ceremony at OSU, Ruiz or some some name, some Hispanic name, frankly. I, I remember it stuck in my head, something like that. But he got like a, a $12, $2 million, $12 million contract to develop these SMRs straight out of the university, straight out of his Ph.D. program. Sure, but, but, but Lonnie, you got to realize that even though his design is something they're going with, they've been experimenting with these designs for decades. That's, the, that's the, the thing, is what's happening at Hanford is all still very top secret. It's all very, um, you know, world technology, the best, you know. They, they have still, the resources there. Minute. This is kind of breaking news to me. They're still conducting scientific research at Hanford? I thought that that was just a cleanup site. Yeah, so that means that there is an acre or two on Hanford that they call... Uh, you know, floor, or I'm trying to think of who the company is behind um, the SMRs. Uh, it is floor. I think it was floor. I think I remember that. Yeah, there, there. But, but I what, what I know is that, um, like at least at least a decade ago, they um, were working on fueling satellites. New scale. Uh, yeah. And using radiation to fuel satellites. I mean, that essentially is an SMR. These are different kinds of SMR styles or designs. And the idea is to have this little tiny thing you can throw on the trunk of your car, you know what I mean, or in a satellite. And the thing is, is if you put it in a Wait satellite... A Wait a minute. They're thinking about putting those up in the atmosphere? Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if they aren't already. This is why that, that, on a this military is... level, they are definitely being used already. SMRs are about being, you know, in a, being more accessible to the public. An SMR is for utilities and power plants in small towns. It's just a different design of a reactor. There are so many designs of reactors. Huh. So let me ask you this then. Your dad worked for a private company? My dad was employed by Exxon Nuclear. Exxon okay. Nuclear was the um, contractor in the 70s. The contracts, <clears throat> so this is another thing that makes it kind of confusing. There's lots of contracts. <clears throat> There's lots of different things that happen at Hanford, and they contract them out, the Department of Energy, DOE, um, or DOD, actually. It started DOD, the Department of Defense, and now it's more DOE, um, will put out these contracts and different businesses can bid for them. Of course, they're usually energy-based businesses like um, Exxon Nuclear, and they did it for so long, and then when they, their contract was over, you know, then like Bechtel went for it, and then Lockheed Martin and Kaiser and um, General Electric had a hand in there. I mean, there, there's probably... I'd say 70 corporations that have had work at Hanford on a large scale. Of course, you know, if you have a contractor in there, like let's say Bechtel, and they need um, to do a cleanup, and the cleanup exists of removing soil, they usually then will hire private contractors, like people who own their own equipment or own their own little business, and they come in and do you know, little like three month projects, two month projects. Um, but that also gets away from the liability. Um, right, because if exactly. I own my own business and I come down with cancer, then they say, well, that's because you smoked or because. Or you didn't protect yourself adequately. You were responsible for protecting yeah, yourself. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so that's kind of the thing there is they want to contract different people because then it's other people's problem and not it never gets back to the federal government when it comes back to the federal government they're like oh shame on you we told you to use safety equipment you know they're like oh i can't believe the contractor didn't pay for the masks that's their fault that they didn't pay for you you know um but there's it's really a lack of responsibility and it's a lot of passing the buck on to the next person and the way that that has become extremely dangerous for hanford is because it was so top secret the first few decades, 
well, most the whole existence, but especially those first decades, um, when they experimented and created something, when they were done with it, they just threw it in a trench. They just threw it out in a hole in the ground in the backyard of Hanford, you know. They didn't realize that it was going to be around forever. So now we're doing this cleanup, and we're going out to these tanks. You know, they have so many of these tanks out there. I can't remember the exact number. I want to say 66. Um, wow. And Are you talking of those tanks that are up on stilts? They look like they're up on stilts. They look No, they're buried in the ground. They're buried okay. in the ground, and the idea was that the tanks would hold the waste, and it's like a... You know, they're leaking hundreds of gallons of waste a day. And so they have to get these tanks cleaned up because they're it leaking into the It looks just river. like the desert, though, when you drive out there because we drove past there. I went out there. And oh, they're when you're so smart, though, Lonnie. you got to think that they're, they're thinking you're a Russian spy when they built this place. So almost all of it is down in the ground. They, like, went out into the valley. And oh, studied. my God. So when you look at across the the desert, you'll see nothing because it's way down in elevation. If we have a big it. earthquake, we're super screwed. Goodbye. Oh, yeah. The entire oh, yeah. West Coast, the life in the West Coast will be dead for millions of years. Well, so this is the other thing about suppression, right? Because Hanford has existed um, since the 20s. 1920s, and nobody ever did the earthquake research. <laughs> it was suppressed. That information was suppressed up until the 2000s. It wasn't until the 2000s that a really great scientist out of the University of Washington proved that Hanford was on like 14 fault lines. He was the first person to bring up what's going to happen if there's an earthquake. Yeah, 14. I thought it if was there eight. Was a, um, it might be eight, technically. I don't. It might be like the bigger ones, you know. But I okay. do know that they run by the dams, and that was. Miriam is M Mimi is telling me on the message board that it's 177 tanks. Thank you, Miriam. Wow. Yes, yes 100. It's, it's an wow. a phenomenal amount, and they all have hundreds of gallons of waste in them, and it only takes you know a handful of that waste to ruin someone's whole world. Like, there, it's. So toxic, and and in the and the problem is is they want to clean this up, and they went through this process of getting a vitrification process so they could suck this stuff out of the tanks and suck it into a new tank. And when they went to do that, they started to realize that nobody knows what's in these tanks because it was so top secret, and so many contractors were involved. They just you know shredded the paperwork. So some of those tanks are rumored to have, like, school buses in them and, you know, all kinds of gigantic things in there um, that were exposed to waste and at the time were considered, you know, garbage. But it's no way going to fit through a pipe to another. It's not a consistent waste. It's, it's every gallon is a different gallon of waste at Hanford. Mimi just wrote me that there's 12 fault lines as found by USGS out of the University of Washington. Yes. Wow. Wow, that is stunning. Yeah, stunning. it is. And, and if so you, you talk, live there, though, Heidi. This is the thing that I want to get to because you're. this is the thing. You live this life. Like you went into Hanford as a little girl. You watched your dad go completely nuts when he tried to be ethical about it. Like they basically... From what I heard you just say was that your dad, his sense of ethics, when he began to realize what the heck he was doing, he was like, well, wait a minute. And when he questioned it, they basically kind of gaslighted him into insanity. Yeah, I truly believe that. And wow. I truly believe that there is a population of crazy people um, who live around Hanford. And, and i sorry to all my friends and family who still live there, you know, but I... I think the radiation does stuff, but I think the culture, the denial, I think that we're having this backlash. You can't, there's so much denial there. There's so much, when you live there, you almost don't even think of Hanford. You don't even think of it. It's just you, There's Hanford so much denial CBS, everywhere. Do you know what today is? It's on the other is? side of the hill, you know? It's on the other side of the hill, upriver, and you just, it's, it's so crazy, Lonnie. They, they have put in so many wineries, and it's all about wine there and farming and people... Um, you know, they're, they're, they're just thinking about wine. I know that sounds really crazy, but they're totally diverted. They're not thinking um, about the dangers because they're told that everything is okay. And you just trust that. And you have to trust that because if you start to question things, um, you start to see it. I mean, I went there. 
I graduated from Evergreen State College. I like to think that I'm a pretty smart science brain person, you know? And I go there, and I'm asking these questions, and I'm being told I'm crazy, and I'm being told that I'm stupid, and pretty much being told to just shut up. And those are by my neighbors, you know? And people will tell you, you know, oh, well, I work for the EPA, and I know everything's fine, or I work for the health department, and we get tests back, and everything's fine. And so you're sitting there, and you're like, well, I mean, honestly, I started thinking, well, maybe they're messing with the tests, you know? And I started thinking, well, maybe... They keep telling us that it's safe and and showing us that it's safe, but the person who's giving us that information isn't really giving us the information right. And it wasn't until the last, you know, three or four years that I started becoming friends with Mimi and and uniting with all of these other anti-nukers in the world that the NRC has this website. And and our friend Erica will go to the website and she'll show us every time Hanford reports their filters are not working which is like every day, every day their sensors are either broken, there's power outages. I mean, it's, it's almost comical to me now. Honestly, it's comical to me on how much that place is not working. And yet we just believe that it is because they don't tell us when it's broken. They don't tell, you know, if you go to the Tri-Cities, the news, um, well, this is kind of a funny story. I thought the reporter at the Tri-Cities Herald was a robot. I thought that it was like a Hanford robot who was just p- printing out articles that were pro Hanford, and it was because they never said and I, anything negative about it. You mean never, never did, it. and it never was really informative either. You know, and it wasn't until Miriam and I did the A15 rally at, at Richland that she introduced me to um, Annette, who was their uh, journalist. There was one Annette Carey was their journalist, and she did all the stories. And when I met her, she was the nicest, sweetest person ever. And I was just like, wow. You know, she's just like, I'm just trying to be a good journalist, you know. And I'm like, you look, you come across to me like a robot, you know. <laughs> Did she start reporting and, after you met her? Did she start saying? Yeah, and she reported that... on us. But, you know, she did change jobs. She didn't stay at the same job. And... Right. You know, you can't, you can't. You know what today is? This is really bizarre. You know what the time period is between March 11th, 2011, Fukushima, the day Fukushima changed everybody's life, and today, 2,000 days. 2,000 days. Today is 2,000 days. Actually, on 2011 is going to be 2011 days. Kind of ironic, isn't it? I mean, yeah, we have I, been I ignoring this. Can you imagine? We've look how much money and how how much war we have spent, how much catastrophe we have spent on the planet over uh, a, a couple of buildings being blown up for whatever reason, however you want to call it, airplane or blown up. You know, right. three thousand Americans. How many other people have died? And yet we have spent two thousand days ignoring the worst catastrophe on the planet talk about denial this is what i'm saying this is denial everybody is ignoring that fukushima is the worst thing on the planet right now so i lived in at tri cities when um fukushima happened and i remember i remember (sighs) thinking um that this was gonna this was it this was what was gonna teach the world about hanford because the West Coast was so worried about fallout, you know, the first week or whatever they talked about fallout from Fukushima, and they started looking at the sensors that the different places had. Uh, I don't know if you remember that, Lonnie, but you could do a readings like they had one down in California, Santa Fe, and they had one at Hanford, and they would tell you the radiation levels that were there, and Hanford's was crazy high. It was so high, they shut them off and stopped giving people access to Hanford. How high and, was and that, it? Like, how high was it? Yeah, I, you know, I'm horrible with um, actual numbers. I really, like, I don't want to miss misquote the, number, yeah. the numbers because I am really bad about it. But I do remember that it was so high, they stopped giving access to it. Well, Radcast.org will have that. She keeps that on her sure. list. Sure, well, that's how it birds, you know, that there was this moment where a bunch of civilians were like, we want to know. And so we all educated ourselves on how to use Geiger counters, which is not easy, you know. It's not an easy no. science. Uh, didn't and, um, you see that video of me and Kevin looking like two, like the Keystone cops trying to use that Geiger counter yes, that Miriam yeah. sent us? We were like, oh. Yes. 
Yeah, no, I mean, it's so, it's so, it's so minute and so accurate, you know, it's really about like setting it somewhere and not messing with it. And, but that's, that's what started to make me think more about our food, you know, because there was all this food grown around Hanford. Um, and one Explain thing Explain the potato really... thing. Tell me yeah. you wrote something in your introduction about potato. Explain that. Uh, so the potatoes are my per- something that I personally lived through. So this is what I talk about. This isn't about something that someone told me or that I learned. What, what happened was is I was a caterer. I worked for wineries um, when we were in eastern Washington, and I was catering this crazy, fancy, fancy, crazy, fancy dinner. And come to find out, these were all the big wigs from McDonald's. And McDonald's was coming in and, and renewing their contracts with all these local farmers that grow McDonald's around. Uh, they all, the largest crop grown uh, around Hanford is potatoes. And then all those independent farmers give that to Lamb Weston. Lamb Weston cuts them and freezes them and then sells them to McDonald's. So when I first, I was just a kid, and I didn't really know what was going on. Would you but say I, that again? This. Would you tell me that again so that I catch okay, on Okay, so there's, so around, all around Hanford are farms. Mm-hmm. All the farms are owned by individuals. Then the individuals get contracts through different corporations. This one is Lamb Weston. Lamb Weston will buy people's potatoes. You bring them their potatoes, and they cut them, and they freeze them. And, and they're Lamb selling Weston, those to McDonald's Corporation, the best prize in the year, from Hanford, yeah. radiated yeah. potatoes. Yeah. And so I didn't really and understand what that meant, though. But Lonnie, I then I watched this. Country? I watched, they, they ship them all around the world, right? So for decades, everyone around the world was eating radioactive potatoes. You know what, um, but of course they're tested, and I'm sure they're safe. But uh, I mean, they know this. They, these people are genocidal maniacs. This is not a secret. I, you know how I found out information, solid information, reading Dr. John Goffman's books, written in 1972, 1970. He did scientific study. He helped invent the nuclear. He discovered the whole monster. I, it's shocking, yeah. honey. So what you happened for me, Lonnie, was I watched a documentary on Netflix. I think it was called Bikini Island. Um, so I didn't know really. I was just home alone and just bored. So I'm watching this video called Bikini Island, and it was about the 1950s and or 40s even when they they tested nukes on Bikini Island, radiated the whole island. And then after 10 years, you know, everything was growing and looks fine there. So they're like, yeah, Native people, you can go back to your island. Right. So these people all went back there. And, uh, and, of course, the government says they had no idea. But the coconuts, the coconuts are super full of potassium. Coconuts absorb potassium. And so the coconuts were absorbing the nutrients. Cesium, just like the fish. I've explained that on the show before. Fish, what fish do is they not just absorb it, but fish actually multiply the the cesium by a thousand times because that's what it does to potassium because there's so little potassium in the water and seawater that their bodies have evolved to expand it a thousand times. Now, coconuts, it might be an equal or it might be exponentially more. Well, than and then there's also bananas, right? right? Bananas are a big one. And then the other one is potatoes. So I started <laughs> this really uh, feeling like they knew, they knew that potatoes, um, I truly do believe this. I believe the government knew that this was going on in the food. Um, and this was sort of like a way to clean the soil. You plant a bunch of potatoes in there, they suck up all the toxins, you ship them out around the world, and uh, that's the solution to pollution is dilution. There you go, boom. And then when people come up with cancer and they all have the same cancer, but they're all over the world, you can't blame it on Hanford. Wow. But about so that being, man, win-win situation. That's what's called yeah. a win-win. They get well, out of it. They make millions of dollars. They get out of their liability. They yeah. stay rich. And then people get sick. They buy their health insurance, and they have to pay for their doctors. Again, it's a win-win. Even though well, and then they have to go pay for radiation treatments. Right. That's the sickness of this, is that you get cancer, and then you still pay the people who gave it to you to, to get you healthy. Right. Because Hanford has twisted. Win, win, you know, win. It's a win. Assets on it. a balance sheet, man. I mean, right. really. 
So, so they do it in other ways, movie. too, Lonnie. There's other ways. You know, the other one that I discovered was the cement. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the soil at Hanford is contaminated. So they take that soil and they ship it other places. Um, and, and I've been told that they ship it t- to go and be mixed into cement. Um, and then they take it into cement mixes, and then, again, it's passed all around the world, um, you know, and it's not contained. So the whole idea of containment, they knew a long time ago that that was a joke. They knew that. They knew that probably in the 50s. And so their strategy was to spread it around because it's safe and it disappears and no one can see it. You and can't no one can smell taste it. it. You can't taste it. And you don't it, so feel I mean, any different, really. There's no way no. to know. No. And so that's that's been the game, you know. And when you look at, like, the different waste sites in Europe that they've cleaned up, pretty much all that means is they pull the dirt out, they put new dirt in, and they plant grass. And they say, okay, it's all clean now. Um, you know, so it, it, this it, is the sad part, Heidi, where it really fundamentally gets down to is that the cat is out of the bag with because of the nuclear pollution. The cat is coming out of the bag. They can't keep hiding it. People are dying, and we're having children that are born grotesquely, which is why they need the wars to kill people because they well, don't want. So this, goes, this goes back to Hanford too, though. You know, is that yes. they are there's poisoned babies there, and and there are babies that are being born without skulls. And Which they, they have denied, no, though. They've denied. They say that yeah. it's not caused by Hanford. It, well, within so three everything, months. Everything is denied by Hanford. Everything. That's right. And, Ev- and, every and first, everybody first, living second. there, why do people living there just accept that you live there? Well, because, for one, there's a pride, right? So I was never old enough to really have that pride of being able to say, like, my dad works at Hanford. But that is, there's a status there. People who work at Hanford get paid a lot of money, so they have the rich. Um, they have huge. And if you go to to the Tri Cities, uh, because the property value is really not very much, people's houses are huge. So you will buy are. like a four hundred thousand square foot house, you know, for two hundred thousand bucks. You wow. have this, you know, great scientist job. Uh, you maybe you go to a church. You go to church. There's this beautiful group of like minded people. Uh, you can go to any store. You can. But let's don't you talk you know about I mean? the fact that our kids have problems that I okay, can't get so, pregnant. So this is what happens: is when you. So of course everyone is sick. I'm not gonna. I'll go there with you. People are very sick there. But when you start talking about why people are sick, it's very random, right? It's not the scientists who get the sick. It's the little kids at the school that are ten miles away from it, or whatever, you know. So then, what happened was. The, because it's a farming community, it was the farmers who get blamed. The farmers are stupid. The farmers don't know how to read. The farmers administered too much uh, chemicals to their crop. The farmers disposed of their chemicals incorrectly. Everything is the farmer's fault. It is never the scientist. The false agreement. Think, well, farmers are poor. They don't go to, they, I mean, I'm, this is generalization. I'm a farmer, so I mean no disrespect to farmers. I love farmers. I moved to Tri-Cities to farm with my husband, and we did have an ag- organic farm there, and I loved our little farm, but then my mom died of ALS uh, really quickly wow. and unexpectedly, and then I had two kids there, and I started learning about the milk project where they had done all of these studies on babies' teeth to see that there was radiation in them that came through their mother's right. milk. That's right. Um, so... I was mortified, honestly. I my my homeland, you know, the the farm I was in, Harriet became this toxic. Um, so it killer. wasn't until you were a mother, like you had grown up there, been around it, moved there. You just thought your dad was just off the charts, a little wacky because he just went well, crazy. You know, in all in truth, in all truth, I really did always believe my dad. I did, but it didn't so, matter because society didn't believe him. So he led the life of a crazy man, whether or not his kids believed him or not. I left Tri-Cities thinking I would never go back to the Tri-Cities. I said, you know, that place is toxic. But then I lived in Seattle where there's a Trident nuclear submarine. And there was all kinds of nukes going on. And Seattle's really pro-nuke, too, quite honestly. Right. Um, And And very, it also, especially post-Fukushima, Seattle's gotten hammered. The Northwest has gotten hammered. 
Yeah, it was. It was there, and there was all kinds of um, stuff happening in Seattle, you know, that was toxic. So I, I thought, oh, I'll move back to the farm and be with my family and have this old fashioned kind of um, romantic upbringing of my children, you know. And then we got there. And and, I, and again, my decisions was based on the fact that Hanford was closed. Hanford had been closed. There was no more manufacturing going on there. And for some reason, that made a difference to me. But then when I moved there, I started to realize it doesn't matter if they make it anymore or not. We have this waste, and it's not going anywhere. And the stories that I was told as a kid was that there was these huge lakes of cooling water that was contaminated that was open air and there was all kinds of open air contaminants out of Hanford because they thought it was contained because they had a fence around Hanford but when in fact there were bees there were birds there were ants there were spiders so that, you know there, there's a food chain mosquitoes mosquitoes yeah and so this food chain was did have access so you know here i am less than 20 miles away from it i was really like 10 miles from my driveway to the gate um and we would have like rabbits and um feral cats and and so all of these animals started to make me think about it you know and then at the same time i'm not even kidding you there would be articles in the paper that they found a radioactive they would say they found radioactive poop Oh, wow. That was rabbit poop. But not to worry that they found it and they cleaned it up and that it was all taken care of. No harm to human health. (laughs) They talked about a railroad, uh, that they had taken a railroad out of Hanford and were selling the metal. But the metal, and they said, and the metal was tested for radiation and it came out fine. However, there were bee nests attached to those rails that were radioactive. So those things made me start thinking, like, wow, like radiation has gone out into our world in ways we don't even know because we're so busy blaming farmers and so busy, you know, blaming, you know, each other and everything that no one's really looking at the obvious problem. Never was there the obvious issue. Because if you blame your obvious issue, if I was to say, I think this is happening because of Hanford, I'm not going to get a job. And if I have a job there, I'm going to get fired. So there's a fear in that. There is a fear, a sincere fear there to speak out. Wow. You'll lose everything. And you'll Just lose like your in reputation. Japan. Exactly in Japan. Exactly. That's the secrecy laws completely in Japan. That's the attitude 100% in Japan. And frankly, I think it's many of the areas regarding St. Louis. Like a lot of people in St. Louis, they're involved in legal courses cases or they work for the people that have done the pollution like they can't help but they work there and yet if they speak out about it even the pollution that they have to live next door that they're trying to get fixed if they say anything about it their jobs and livelihoods get threatened the secrecy now why do you think why let me i'm wrapping my brain around this because it goes against Everything that I was raised to believe as Americans, we are. Right. Doesn't it? Like, as Americans, I was raised, like, this is the thing. Even, like, on Friday, I'm going to have Michael join me as a co-host. And I'm hoping, I haven't confirmed this, but I'm hoping I can have Dana Durnford on so that Michael can ask him some different questions than what I ask him because Michael is a completely different type of co-host. His show circles around pro-military, pro-guns, totally different part of the country. And I think it's super important for all of us to engage in conversation. But one core thing that we both have, no matter what, is a strong core belief that as Americans, we stand for integrity and honor and honesty and that our government has betrayed us at a very deep level. Well, that's interesting that you you spin it like that because Hanford usually hires veterans. Like my dad was a Vietnam veteran. Um, they they hire veterans, so of course there's a pride there in America, and there's a trust. Right. And they they go there to protect it, you right. know. 
so as far as the military, I mean, the, the secrecy came from the military. I mean, this started in the 1920s. It was, it was during, um, you know, the Nazis. And quite honestly, most of the, the nuclear science was done in Germany. And those people, Oppenheimer and Einstein and all those guys, fled Germany to the U.S. And they did all of this information pretty secretly to make sure the U.S. got it before Germany. That did happen. But then it was already top secret, and it was a, it was a war thing. So they just kept that culture. They only Tri-Cities was very small area in the 1920s. It pretty much was just Native tribes who lived out there because it was really hard to live there, especially without power. And, you know, so here comes all these nuclear scientists that are – military people and they set up pretty much a mil Hanford was a military camp in the middle of nowhere and there was a lot of security around it so there were a lot of men who came just as security they weren't even scientists and so that's what created that culture they created the culture they created the population it was a, it's to me when i go there it's like i'm going to a government town it feels much like going to a coal mining town in west virginia you know what it felt like to me? It felt like that movie, The Stepford Wives. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was bizarre. Like, we yeah. stuck out like a sore thumb. People knew we weren't from there. Do you know well, what I mean? So, Especially so, but, when we went off the beaten path, when we started heading towards the reactors, right? Their police officers followed us. Yeah, no, you know I never, I, mean? I was from there, but I didn't belong. You know, like I went to the, wow. I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about, Lonnie. Like you, they, you were to conform. Everybody's supposed to have a really clean car. There is like these standards, it's kind of the standards of like what you would have to go to church. You're expected to have these kind of, um, expected you know, to go to church. Let's be clear. You need to go to church there. I'm sure. Well, you I would be very clean of... and you're going to wear really nice clothes and you're going to look really nice when you do. That's what I'm trying to say. Like, the people go take mm -hmm. a lot of, it's almost like decades behind, you know. Everywhere else has, like, grunge, and everyone else, like, you know, in the world kind of got grungy, but not the Tri-Cities. It's, it's a very clean, clean place. If you go there, it's, it's very clean. Well, you know what? That's probably because they're, like, sort of psycho because they know they're ignoring the elephant in the room, that they're all participating in the dirtiest industry in the world. Yeah. I mean, yeah. seriously, they're all keeping yeah. their trap shut, even the farmers growing the food there. I mean, interestingly enough that you talk about the potatoes, because I went to uh, a, a Hanford Challenge presentation in Portland once, and a man stood up and said, you know what, what's the plan, because I'm a potato farmer from Eastern Oregon. I came here to find out, because if anything happens, I mean... We produce a large portion of the potatoes for the country. It's the nation's like, largest. We make more. So this is the other thing. We, Washington makes the largest amount of potatoes in the nation. The second largest is Idaho. And you know <laughs> where they grow it in Idaho, there's also a huge waste uh, site. Idaho has a huge waste site, So, which is right downwind from Hanford. I mean, they, they, they know these things. They don't do it just random. You know what I mean? Like, they know what they're doing. Uh, the other thing about Hanford that I think is really interesting is it's the largest dairy farms in the nation. So that's even, after the tooth study, even after the tooth study showing that yeah. children, that the milk yeah. exponentially magnifies just like the fish, the radiation. Yeah, and you can milk Google it, and it will tell you. It will tell you that Eastern Washington puts out the most milk in the nation. Almost all of little the little kids who eat Dairy Gold when they go to school, they have that lunch milk. Dairy uh -huh. Gold is outside. It's in eastern Washington. So it's really the same. It's the same strategy as the French fries. Wow. They, 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 they are. They're targeting the people. It's not a, it's a test. It's not, and we just have faith, and, and they're taking advantage of the American way that people will defend this American dream not knowing that it's actually uh, genocide. That's a pretty large statement, but it is genocide, actually. It so is. what do you think, let me ask you this, having, you know, coming from a scientific background, you've been an organic farmer, you grew up in Hanford, 
I actually just double checked the dates. I forgot to include the end date when I did this. So uh, as of August 31st, today is actually day 2001. Okay. So we have now passed 2,000 days of ignoring Fukushima. Do you think that's an experiment or you think it's just so out of control, they're overwhelmed, they have no idea what the heck to do? Oh, poor Japan. I think that... Um, well, not just Japan, Japan, the rest of us. <laughs> right, right. But I mean, I think that, you know, you would think that after World War II, Japan would never agree to have nu nukes there, you know? They had to. Like, the United States forced them to. They, okay, they had so we no did. Kind of like you would an experiment, you know? And we forced them to do it. Um, then they have it all over this island. This island is extremely volatile. We know that there's earthquakes. We know there's tsunamis. Um, but again, that these the creators are so arrogant, they think that their machines are greater than nature, you know. And then Fukushima happened, um, and they don't know how to fix it. And, uh, you know, I found it really ironic that they were sending scientists from Hanford over to Fukushima to show them how to fix it. And essentially all they did was put the waste in garbage bags. They said, the only way you can fix this is to pick it up you know, and contain it, and we're going to move it somewhere, but nobody says or knows where everything's getting moved, you know. They're burning the it. We do know too. what they're doing with it. They came up with an idea. They are burning it. Sure, and you know what? That That is something that I experienced when I was at Hanford. There is a lot of fires at Hanford. There is a lot of fires at Hanford, and every summer there are huge fires, and I am convinced that was their way of cleaning up the waste. Say that because again. once it goes up in air, again, it's a solution to pollution is dilution. It sends it everywhere. It's everywhere. That's what you, you think that the uh, so-called uh, fires that are always out there? Yeah. Are oh, God, yeah. You know, uh, I can't remember the exact year. I wrote it down on my little writing thing. I'd have to look it up. But I'm, I'm going to say, like, an average of, like, 2004, 2005. Um, I was driving on a highway back from Seattle with my husband and kids, and we saw the reddest cloud. It looks like a cloud you would see at sunset, except it was like 1.30 in the afternoon. And my husband and I, and it was over Hanford, and it was drifting west. And we said, that is the weirdest looking cloud ever. And we went home, and about two days later, there was uh, uh, an article that came out that admitted that they had had a huge leak on the pipeline but the amount of waste lost was unknown. And that night, a huge wildfire started that burned acres and acres and acres of Hanford. And uh, I am convinced that they did that on purpose so that then no one could measure how much waste, so that the EPA couldn't find them. It was to get out of the fines. If you can't, if you can't calculate it, then it didn't happen. Right. If there's no victim, there's no crime. Yeah, and that is the story of Hanford, man. The victims just wow. disappear. The cancer, you know, I look back at the people who I grew up with who've passed and people who have grew up and their, their siblings have passed prematurely or their parents have passed prematurely, and all of us have different reasons why they died in different ways. A lot of us are all cancer, but we still, you know, we, we can't say it was there, you know? Like, it's just not allowed. You're not allowed to blame Hanford. You're just not. How do we break that cult? I guess the way we break this culture is by getting the truth out. And making it safe for people to come out. You know, uh, there was a, uh, a Department of Energy and a DOD uh, hearing uh, years ago. It was probably 2012. And a bunch of uh, people from Portland got in vans and cars and drove to this hearing. And they were, they were there to support me and to support the other people um, but it was a it was a meeting about whistleblowers, and it was a meeting where the DoD and DOE said, you know, this this is a project where we don't know the outcome. Uh, this is continually a, a research product where we have to get feedback from the employees in order to learn how to be better at this, and we can't do this without the employees. But nobody is speaking out here, and no no employees are telling us what to do different and we want to know why 
And so wow. people stood up and said, well, it's because we get fired. It's because they get fired, you know. And I stood up and said, you know, I was raised there, and I was taught not to ever question it. You just don't even get to question it. You don't even get to have opinions about it. You let the people who know what they're doing do it, and you just do what they ask of you, but you don't question them. And that was how I was raised. Luckily, my dad was one of those people who was like, no, you ask questions. You question authority. If someone tells you it's safe, I want you to know why. Why is it safe? How is this safe? And that's what started my critical thinking as a young child. And that's when I was raised, you know, as an adult in the Tri-Cities saying, okay, if there's no nuclear reactor working at Hanford, what's the plume? (laughs) Tell me, what's the plume? You know, and then I find out about CGS, and then they say, I say, okay, if it's not dangerous, then why, why is there so much steam? And where does that steam go? And what's in that steam? And then they say, oh, well, we have filters for that and everything. And it's filters. just water. It's just water. It's just Don't water, worry about yeah. And then, and then later, you know, then I find out the NRC has all of these claims by um, the, react- the CGS that it's broken and this wasn't working. And, this, you know, they shut it down for a year to try to fix it. It's old. It's old equipment and it's old technology, and it, it's it's stupid for the taxpayers to keep paying for it. It's just stupid. We're default. We're the ones. We're the ones that keep paying the taxes that build them and that support them. Wow. Well, the thing is, how do you stop doing that? You see, I, I'm a professional. We work... You know, I work to help people actually get their taxes straight, right? So I'm not one of those people that say we don't need to pay our taxes. What we need to do, this is where I think we need to do, is just stop the military budget. It's just ridiculous. Isn't part of the military budget? But isn't, I think I'm wrong. It's not the military budget. It's the Department of Energy budget that funds the military, correct? Oh, so Hanford was pretty much built by the people of Washington in their public utilities bill. It's public utilities that pay for Hanford. Hanford actually took out a bond. It was like the biggest bond in the nation to build Hanford. Uh, it wasn't called Hanford. It was called WHOOPS, and that's an acronym, a sad acronym, but it was W-H-O-O-P-S. And WHOOPS um, was supposed to be, I believe, nine reactors or eight, and they borrowed the money from the taxpayers to build it, and then in building it realized what a bad bad idea it was and so they only finished one and then they defaulted on that bond it's the biggest default Hanford owes the taxpayers money that's where uh, you do public utilities that's the thing is even now to this day people in Seattle when they pay their public utility bill their PUD bill they're giving money to Hanford Okay, that sort of left me behind. Could you? Re- I hate to keep asking you to repeat this, but sometimes these that gets kind of complicated. You're telling me that Hanford owes money to the taxpayers? Yeah, yeah, because they defaulted in the bond that they took out to build. Well, it. how come the taxpayers don't know that? Because it's all top secret. No one talks about it, and everyone just drinks the but milk. But doesn't the government you- doesn't don't our elected officials know about it? I, you know, Monty, that's a good question. I don't know how they got away with it. It was in the 80s. I know that. It was the late 70s and early 80s. Well, well, let's do some digging on that. You know what, Heidi? I have to cut this. I hope you come back because you're awesome. I mean, I'm really excited about this. We have about 30 seconds left. I'm speaking with Heidi Lambert from No Nukes Northwest. As you all can hear, she's a plethora of information because she grew up in the Tri-Cities, got a college degree, went back. Back there, grew an organic farm, and then had kids and went, huh? <laughs> Pretty much what? sums it up, huh, Heidi? I yeah. want to thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, please do go to No Nukes Northwest Facebook page. There's going to be a button up for donating soon, uh, just to shamelessly promote them. Uh, we There is things that we can do to stop the nuclear industry, and we all need to take action, not just donating money. Take action. Do your own thing. Anna, get informed. Thank you, Heidi, for joining us. I hope to have you back. Thank you, Lonnie, for your hard work. Thank you. Bye-bye.